Okay, everybody, no one's here yet, but I'm going to go ahead and start and add people as they show up. <clears throat> Today, we're doing chapter 9, 11, and 13, uh, joints and muscles and uh, surface anatomy. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, chapter 9 is all about articulations or joints. What is an articulation? Well, a joint or articulation is a place of contact between bones, between bone and cartilage, or between bones and teeth. Each of them has a different name. The scientific study of joints is called arthrology. Arthro means joint and ology means to study. How do we name joints? They're usually derived from the names of the articulating bones. So for example, the glenohumeral joint is a joint formed between the glenoid cavity, which is part of your scapula at your shoulder, and the head of your humerus. So there you see it, glenohumeral joint, a chromoclavicular joint, a chromion of the scapula and the clavicle, et cetera. So you can see these different joints here. Okay, what does mobility and stability have to do with joints? Well, the motion permitted in a joint ranges from none to various extensive motions. The structure of a joint determines both its mobility and its stability. So if a joint is more mobile, it's less stable. And if it's more stable, it's less mobile. So for example, very mobile would be your shoulder joint. For example, someone throwing a ball or a pitcher. Lots of mobility, but not as strong, can be easily dislocated. More stable would be your hip, even more with your elbow. And the most stable, but least mobile, would be the sutures between the skull bones. Let's talk about some classifications of joints. One type of classification has to do with types of connective tissue. Now, please note on your review question and exam, in this next section, there may be several, all of the above are correct answers. Please don't forget that those are usually the right answer when offered on my test. So when you see that option, all of these answers are correct. That's a better answer than something that looks familiar to you. So keep an eye on that. And especially in this section of this chapter, there's gonna be several of those on the test. So the type of connective tissue that binds the articulating surfaces of the bones helps classify it. Whether space occurs between the articulating bones is another way to classify the joints. A fibrous joint occurs where bones are held together by dense, regular fibrous connective tissue. Well, I'll be showing you some of those. A cartilaginous joint occurs where bones are joined by cartilage. And we're going to see that between diaphyses and epiphyses of lung bones, as well as in the rib cage. The most common is called a synovial joint. It has a fluid-filled synovial cavity. Bones are enclosed within a capsule. The capsule keeps the fluid in there. And the bones are joined by various ligaments that generally normally make up that capsule. Functionality of a joint is based on the extent of movement they permit. So the least mobile is called a synarthrosis. Syn means with or together. So it's an immovable joint. We're going to see that in your skull bones. Amphiarthrosis is a slightly movable joint. We're going to see that in the lower leg. And diarthrosis is a freely movable joint. Most places where you see a lot of movement, for example, shoulder, hip. Fibrous joints are the first we're gonna talk about. Most are immovable or slightly movable. They have no joint cavity, so there's no synovial fluid in there. And there's three types of fibrous joints, none of which provide a lot of movement. Gomphoses, we're gonna find these in your teeth, sutures in your skull, and syndesmosis in a couple of places. We'll get to that when we get to it. Okay, syndesmosis. Fibrous joints where articulating bones are joined by ligaments only. Allow for some movement. Now, please note, this is a structural category. The functional classification of it is amphiarthrosis, which means some movement. So it's a little confusing. There's structural categories and functional categories. So for example, the joint between the radius and ulna here in your forearm is a good example of syndesmosis. The tibia and fibula, which is your lower leg. So some movement, but not a lot. Basically those bones just kind of move past each other a little bit to a small extent. Now suture, least mobile joint. The fibrous joints in the skull connected by dense regular connective tissue. Now, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, there is some difference <coughs> in how much movement is allowed by these depending on your age. If you're a newborn, there's a lot of movement allowed. If you're an adult, no movement allowed. 
So there is some difference in how much mobility there is in these joints, depending on the age. So keep that in mind when you're working on review questions and working on the exam. Now, what are the sutures for? They allow the growth of the skull bones and the brain, so it allows the skull bones to expand. They allow for some movement, especially in newborns. Uh, but here we're talking about functional classification as synarthrosis, which means no movement, because the functional classification is based on how it is when you're an adult, not that it's very different from when you're an infant or newborn. Remember, in your heart, there's a lot of difference between when you're first born and when you're an adult. So there are changes that occur after you're born, and this is one of those. So sutures of the skull, in anything, anybody older than five or 10 years old, virtually no movement possible, except for growth. After about age five, by the way, your skull doesn't really get much bigger. It's your facial bones. They get bigger after that. When the bones fuse, the joint becomes a synostosis. Now, in this case, instead of them being connected with uh, connective tissue, they've completely fused. And you're going to see that in the skulls of fully uh, mature adults and in the oscoxa. The oscoxa are your hip bones that don't include your sacrum or coccyx. And when you're very, very young in, in, the, in the womb, the three bones that make up each of the oscoxa or hip bones are separate. And if you look at a fetal skeleton, you'd see those. Okay, gomphosis, these are in your teeth. It's a fibrous joint between tooth and jaw. The teeth are connected to the maxilla and mandible with what are called periodontal ligaments. So it connects your teeth to your jaw, and they allow for no movement. Now, the text does say no movement, but if that were really honestly the case, then uh, periodontal work would not be possible. Now, the question is, do... Uh, let's say like large plates of land, do they move? Well, if you look at them, they don't move at all. But over many, many, many years, they do move. Crustal plates move. So even though there's no real movement involved, if you put enough pressure on these gomphoses with an E in it would be the plural, you can move teeth around and that's how braces works, right? So a little bit of movement over a very long period of time is possible. But when it asks on the test, the answer is no movement. I just want you to know that if it were indeed actually no movement, then uh, braces wouldn't work. So just keep that in mind. But for the test, go with what's written on the page. Functionally classified as sin arthrosis, no movement, because you can't just wiggle your teeth. And if you can, you're in trouble. Okay, there's the periodontal ligaments connecting the teeth to the jaw. There's sutures in the skull. And here is a syndesmosis. The one between the radius and the ulna isn't as good of an example as the one between the tibia and fibula in the lower leg, but it still works. Cartilaginous joints. Now, this is a different kind of joint. Now, there's not a sliding movement at all here, but it's two bones connected by a ligament. The ligament is between the two bones. There's no joint cavity, and there's two kinds, synchondroses and symphyses, and I'll explain why they're different in a, in a bit. Okay, synchondrosis. This is where two pieces of bone are connected where there's virtually no movement at all. That is, there's no sliding motion at all possible. And they're not that different than the other one, but I'll explain where they are and why they're different. So for example, the one you might be most uh, familiar with is how your sternum connects to your ribs. What this allows, it allows your ribs to bend a little bit without the bone bending so that you can inhale and exhale, and it comes in handy when CPR is being performed on you. The other place that you find this is in the epiphyseal plate, which connects the epiphysis, which is the end of a long bone, with the diaphysis, or shaft of the bone. So it's always hyaline cartilage, a, a plate between the bones, or a long piece of hyaline cartilage. A good example is the epiphyseal plates and growing bones, or the joints between the ribs and the sternum. The functional classification is synarthrosis because there's no significant movement between these bones other than the flexion of the hyaline cartilage itself. So it's still considered a synarthrosis, even though the cartilage itself can bend slightly, giving a little bit of motion between the ribs and the sternum. Okay, symphysis. Now, still cartilage, but instead of hyaline cartilage, it is fibrocartilage. So the places where you see bone, 
bones, excuse me, bones joined with cartilage, fibrocartilage specifically, is a symphysis. And the place we find that is between the two pubic bones, hence symphysis pubis, and the intervertebral discs that are found here. Now, these can be removed. You may have heard of this, a, a slip disc or a disc that's removed so you can fuse two vertebrae. This is not really possible in the other kind of cartilaginous joint, only possible here. And amphiotherosis meaning, this is a little bit different, a little bit of motion permitted because uh, the vertebrae do move relative to each other a lot more even than your, rib, your ribs move relative to your sternum. I think it's a matter of degree, but <coughs> that's what they say. All right, synovial joints. These are the most common ones. These are the joints we think of. Shoulder joints, wrist joints, knee joints, ankle joints, where there's a lot of movement uh, available. Freely movable articulations, they're classified as diarthrosis. Di meaning two, as in two separate bones. Bones are separated by a space called a joint cavity. Now, there, it's a potential space, which means it's filled with fluid. It's not really a big open space. Uh, and all of the space in there is filled with synovial fluid. It's the most commonly known joints in the body. We find it, as I talked about earlier, the glenohumeral or shoulder joint, temporomandibular, which is right where your jaw attaches to your skull, elbow joint, and knee joint. I don't need to show you my elbow. You know what it looks like. All right, general anatomy of synovial joints. What are some basic features? It has an articular capsule, which is made up of dense connective tissue that strengthens the joint, and it also holds the fluid in. The joint cavity is a space containing the synovial fluid that allows separation of articulating bones. Now, there's not going to be a big gap, just enough of a gap so that fluid can get in between the bones, usually between two layers of hyaline cartilage. The synovial fluid that you would find in there is viscous, oily liquid, kind of like car oil. The articular cartilage covers the ends of the bones, reducing friction and absorbing impact during motion. The ligaments make up the capsule of the joint as well as strengthening the joint. Nerves are found in there that detect damage and help detect joint angle, so you know where your body is at all times. And blood vessels help nourish the living cells. Okay, this is a good image of a typical synovial joint in your finger. You see these different structures. I used to have this as a fill-in, but because you are online, fill-ins are rather silly. So these are some of the key structures that you should know about a synovial joint. More about synovial fluid. It's secreted by the synovial membrane, and it has three functions. First, it lubricates articulating surfaces like oil. Number one most important thing, in the same way that oil lubricates the metal moving parts in your car, uh, <clears throat> synovial fluid, fluid acts like car oil. But <laughs> in addition, because the cartilage doesn't have blood vessels, the synovial fluid contains nutrients and oxygen that helps get the oxygen and nutrients to the living cells of the cartilage, which are called chondrocytes. And when you move, that circulation is enhanced, giving more nutrients to those cells. So activity is also, believe it or not, really good for your cartilage. As long as it's not really, really high impact, it could cause some damage. And one of the other important things is synovial fluid acts as a shock absorber. Believe it or not, just that really thin layer of fluid between those two bones helps displace and evenly distribute the force across the joint evenly. Some more structures of the synovial joint. You may have heard of a thing called bursitis. Well, bursitis is when these bursae, bursa, singular, bursae, plural, these fibrous sac-like structures that contain, contain synovial fluid, and they're lined by a synovial membrane. So you put them in places where you need to reduce friction where a tendon or ligament rubs across the bone. You may have heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, well, there are bursae in there, and there are bursae in your shoulders. And if you overwork those joints, those ligaments and tendons are going to rub across the surface of the bursa and irritate it, making it inflamed, hence bursaitis, bursitis. You also find fat pads in these synovial joints. They're often distributed along the periphery of the synovial joint. They act as packing material, provide some protection, and fill the spaces that form when bones move. This is really just kind of like a material that moves into place when your joint uh, geometry changes. So in a, there's a place where there isn't any material, you bend your knee, there is a space now, the fat can move and take that space. Tendons are also found 
in synovial joints. They attach muscle to bone. They help stabilize the joints and often possess the tendon sheath. This is a little bit closer to when I want to talk to you guys about uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is this tendon sheath is sometimes called a tunnel, carpal tunnel. Your carpals are your wrist, and there's tubes that these uh, ligaments slide through. So carpal tunnel syndrome means that these ligaments are sliding through these tunnels or tendon sheaths, irritating them. And this often often happens with supermarket checkers who are constantly flicking their wrist, scanning items in a supermarket. Here's another image showing you a more uh, complete uh, synovial joint. You can see the fat pads, which is the slight material here, the bursae, which are these uh, synovial fluid filled bags that are supposed to reduce friction. See the synovial membrane. Uh, this is the quadriceps group, uh, upper leg, and some of the other muscles have been re removed. So you can see the basic structures here. So this shows you the uh, common flexor tendon sheath. These are the tunnels and the carpals are right underneath it. So it would lead, if you inflame these tunnels, it's called carpal tunnel syndrome. You can see the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus, um, all of which are sliding through these tunnels. What are some different types of synovial joints? They're classified by the shapes of their articulating surfaces. It gets a little bit complicated, so try to keep track of it here. The types of movement they allow is another way to classify synovial joints. So unaxial, if the bone moves in just one plane. So for example, the elbow moves in just one plane, like a hinge. Think of it if it's hinge-like, it's uniaxial or in one axis, in one plane. Biaxial, if the bone moves in two planes. So for example, my thumb can go this way and it can go this way, so biaxial. Multiaxial, if the bone moves in multiple planes, so my shoulder, can go in many different planes. So that would be multiaxial. So there you go. <clears throat> types of synovial joints from least movable to most freely movable. The six specific types of synovial joints are planar or gliding joints. You find those in your wrist and ankles, really the top of your foot. Hinge joints, which would be like your knee, and elbow. Pivot joints, uh, which you would find in your neck and in your arm to allow you to do rotation. Uh, condyloid or ellipsoidal joints, you would find those in um, your shoulder and hip. Saddle joint is a very specific kind of joint that you find just at the base of your thumb that allows you to do opposition. And uh, ball and socket joints. Okay, so the condyloid joints are kind of a modified ball and socket. So the condyloid joints, the better example of that would be at your jaw. Mandibular condyle going into your uh, mandibular socket. Um, ball and socket joint specifically is talking about the head of the humerus and the shoulder and the uh, femur articulating with the oscoxia in the acetabulum. So those, so really condylate joints are a form of ball and socket, but because they're not as round, they're given their separate subdivision of a ball and socket joint. Okay, gliding or planar joints. I told you you find them in wrists and ankles. They're the simplest synovial articulation, least movable. They're unaxial, which means that they just kind of slide in one plane. Articular surfaces are flat, hence the term planar. Examples are intertarsal and intercarpal joints. That would be the small bones of your wrist and ankle. Now, interestingly, it's really the proximal part of your hand and the proximal part of your foot. What we call our wrist, or our wrist joint, is the gap between the carpals and the arm joint and the arm bones. And the same with our ankle. It's really the top of our foot that are the tarsals, not the ankle proper that we would normally label. The hinge joints, they're uniaxial because they go in one plane. So even though there's more movement here, it's still sliding in just one plane. Good example is your elbow and knee are both uniaxial hinge joints. Pivot joints, articulating surface of the bone, fits into a ring formed by a ligament and another bone. Best example is in your neck. So you see the atlas and axis articulate this way with this ligament across here. Allows really good pivot motion. You also find that in your uh, capitulum of your humerus, articulating with your radius. Okay, condyloid joints. You find these in uh, metacarpophalangeal joints. 
uh, and in your jaw, good example. So you can see they're somewhat similar to a bone socket, but not quite as round, a little bit flatter, more like a planar joint, but some curvature. So it allows a little bit of movement. So you can do this and you can do this. So they are biaxial. So they allow this spreading of the fingers and the bending of the fingers. So there you go, biaxial. Saddle joints. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember when Pringles used to have writing on them, jokes, right? Uh, but they did. So I wanted to bring a picture of a Pringle in. This was a while ago. But um, why do I bring a picture of a Pringle in? Because they are shaped like a saddle, which is curved upward, front to back and curve downward, left to right. And that's why it's called a saddle joint because that's how saddles are built. Bones have both a concave and convex region. They're similar to a saddle or a Pringle chip. They provide a greater uh, range of motion than most types. So your thumb has lots of movement possible because of this type of joint. And you can see the saddle joint here uh, between the uh, first metacarpal and the trapezium, uh, which is one of your carpal bones in your the base of your hand, which we call our wrist. Ball and socket joints are have the most movement possible, maybe with an exception of that uh, saddle joint. The multaxial joints with the greatest range of motion. The ball or head of one bone fits into a cup-like depression, which would be a cavity or acetabulum of the less mobile bone. Example, shoulder and hip. So you can see here it's your hip and in your shoulder, ball and socket. Okay, so this is some movements that are going to be allowed, uh, abduction, which is bringing towards the center, adduction away from the center. Instead of me standing up and demonstrating these, you might want to look on YouTube for a demonstration of how these work. Flexion, basically bending your arm, extension, straightening your arm, hyperextension. Oh, let me show you from the side. So uh, flexion for your, your head would be down to your chin. Extension would be back to anatomical. Hyperextension would be looking past anatomical. So not, not most joints, believe it or not, can be hyperextended without injury. But your neck is a good example of that. Anything past anatomical position would be considered hyperextension. Lateral flexion would be bending sideways. If you were doing like touching your hip or touching the side of your leg. And circumduction, basically going with your arm around in a big circle. Gliding motion, rotational motion, check these out. Some special movements, depression. So for example, if I start with my shoulders elevated here and I drop them, that's called depression. Elevation is if I raise my shoulders. Dorsiflexion is if I lift my toes up into the sky, that's dorsiflexion. Generally only found in the foot. So when you're lifting your toes up off the ground, that's dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion, pushing towards the plantar surface. That's if you're standing up on your tippy toes or pointing your toes. So pointing your toes and lifting your toes all the way up to the sky are the opposite, dorsal and plantar flexion. Eversion has to do with the tilt of your foot. Inversion has also has the tilt of your foot. Hard for me to demonstrate here. Pronation, moving the forearm where the palm is turned posteriorly. So if you push your palms backwards so that the front of someone standing in front of you would see the back of your hands. Supination is turning out or holding the soup. So if you have your palms facing the observer, that's supination. Protraction, movement of body part anteriorly. So I can show you with my jaw. It looks kind of silly, but if I move my jaw like this, forward, my jaw comes forward, that's protraction. Retraction, the opposite. So I go from anatomical to both look kind of silly. I don't know how well you could see that because I couldn't see you watching me, but uh, there you go. In opposition is moving a thumb across your palm. Okay, so just to quiz you, if you're in quizzing yourself, moving your arm away from the center line, what is that? Abduction. So the way to think about it is if somebody is abducted from their home, they're taken away from their home base. And the home base for the body is right up against your side. So abducted or taken away. Now if you move towards the body, you're adding to the center. So that's called adduction. Three, abduction away from the center line and adduction. Not as good with the wrist, but it still works. Adduction, moving your leg towards the midline, towards anatomical position, adding to the center. 
six abduction away from the center line, kidnapping the body part away from the body part, from the body center. Same thing here, seven abduction. So you're bringing, uh, excuse me, taking your fingers away from the center line. And then eight, adding back to the center line would be adduction. So if you remember my demonstration, uh, if you go forward, it's kind of like bending your arm. What do you call that? Flexion. Good. So flexion. So if I go back from flexion to normal anatomical position, that's extension. And what did I say? Looking up in the sky? Hyperextension. Good. Bending your arm. Flexion. Straightening your arm. Extension. Now, you can't do hyperextension with your elbow because of the way the joint is set up. Now, the hand and the foot work together. So hyperextension going past anatomical. Remember, anatomical is with your hand straight. So this would be flexion, extension, hyperextension. So that's not an injury because of the way it's set up. Nine, moving to the side, lateral flexion. 10, moving away, bending the knee, flexion, straightening the knee. So there you go with some of these. And here's some more movements, rotation, head. Lateral rotation is when you go from uh, your arm across your tummy, rotating outwards. That has to do with the movement of the uh, glenohumeral joint. Medial rotation, the opposite, moving your hand back towards your tummy. And then you can laterally or medially rotate your foot in the uh, acetabulum with the femoral head. Okay, moving your shoulders downward. You guys remember what I said with that? Depression. So you move something downward. Raising your shoulders. What's the opposite of being depressed? Elevated. So raising it up. Lifting your toes up to the sky. Dorsiflexion. Because that's the dorsal surface flexing upward. Plantar flexion. The plantar surface is being flexed. This is not called flexion extensions, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion because of the way the, the ankle is set up. Now, these are the two special ones I didn't show you. Inversion, where you're in the center line of your foot is tilted inward. And eversion is where the side of your foot or lateral portion of your foot is tilted upward. So inner point. So the way I always like to think of it is inversion is kind of like standing on a small ball, like a soccer ball. An E version would be like standing in a V-shaped trough with both of the outsides of your feet tilted outward. Imagine if you were like in a in a drain, drainage ditch that was shaped like a V. If you're walking right through the center of it, center of it, your feet would be outside part of your feet would be tilted upward. Okay, one pronation, two supination, three protraction, jaw forward. Uh, Retraction and then opposition. Okay. That is nine. So let's go ahead and jump forward to chapter 11. Okay, now we're going to be talking about axial muscles. There's not a lot to really lecture on with this. It's more of a presentation or just showing you these. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because there's not a huge amount of material on the test from this chapter. So axial muscles have both their origins and insertions on parts of the axial skeleton. That's why they're axial muscles. They support and move the head and spinal column. They function in nonverbal communication by these are the facial muscles. They move the lower jaw during chewing, so all the muscles on the side of your face. Aid in breathing, intercostal muscles and diaphragm. Support and protect abdominal and pelvic organs, some of the muscles inside your pectoral and abdominal cavities. They're not responsible for stabilizing or moving the pectoral or pelvic girdles or their attached limbs. So it has everything to do with only the structures associated with the axial skeleton, nothing to do with arms, legs, or the girdles. So this is a good image showing you the different muscles uh, of the, uh, really the entire body, deep and superficial. So these are, this is a really good uh, reference for all these muscles. It's not showing you just axial muscles. These are all the muscles that really you should know, at least uh, for the beginning part of the class. Okay, showing you deep muscles on our right, his left, or her left, I guess. 
And then on our left or his right, superficial muscles. And same with posterior here, deeper muscles on his and our right. So why is this different? Because the person is facing away, their right and our right are the same, their left and our left are the same. <laughs> muscles of the head and neck separate into several specific groups. They almost all originated on the skull or hyoid bone, which is the bone right at the top of your uh, larynx. Muscles of facial expression or originate on the superficial fascia or on the skull bones. Here's an interesting little factoid. Uh, the muscles of facial expression, many of them don't attach to any bones at all. They're just in the superficial fascia and that it gives us our facial expressions. Uh, they contort the skin, allowing it to move and give us our facial expressions. These are some of the muscles associated with, now not all facial muscles have no attachment to bone, but many don't. So for example, orbicularis oculi does not have a muscular attachment. Um, and the same with orbicularis oris around your mouth. This showing you the muscles of a cadaver. These are the lateral muscles of the face and head, temporalis covering the temporal bone. And you can look at all the rest of these muscles. Masseter is the main muscle associated with chewing along with the temporalis. And the same muscles then in a cadaver. Muscles of facial expression, several are associated with the nose. The mouth is the most expressive part of the face. I don't know if you guys have ever watched um, animated, like 3D animated movies. There's always something wrong with the mouth, the way the mouth moves in those movies. It's because it's so unique and it's so specialized and you can tell what people are saying just by watching their mouths. And those movies never seem to get it quite right. <laughs> Unless you spend a ton of money like they do in Avatar movies when they take every single frame and make sure it's perfect. Uh, muscles in the area are very diverse, moving in different directions, doing very different jobs. Abicularis oris consists of the muscles that encircle opening the mouth. When it contracts, the mouth closes. So this shows you the different muscles and the expressions responsible for each. Extrinsic eye muscles. Now we're talking about the eye muscles that move your eyes up and down in your eye socket. We're not talking about the muscles on the outside. They're called extrinsic because on they're on the outside of your eye, but on the inside of your eye socket, just to clarify. <clears throat> they're termed extrinsic because they originate within the orbit and start on the sclera. There are muscles on the inside of your eye that those would be called intrinsic eye muscles. And there are muscles on the outside of your eye socket, and those would be facial expression muscles. All right. There's six extrinsic eye muscles, the rectus muscles, one, two, three, four, left, right, up, and down, and the oblique muscles that actually rotate your eye within the socket. So this shows you most of those muscles. You see the lateral rectus if you're looking from the side, superior rectus meaning on top, inferior on the bottom, uh, medial rectus would be on the opposite side of the eye. And you can see these muscles here, the inferior oblique, and then the superior oblique comes in and kind of makes a little U-turn in the trochlea. And there's the medial view of the same eye. They're called extrinsic because on the outside of the eye, even though they're within the um, ocular cavity or eye cavity. Okay, if you're looking from the anterior view without the eye being present, you can see all the muscles there. And when they pull, they move the eye in different directions. And this is the superior view showing the muscles and their attachment. Muscles of mastication refers to chewing. So mastication, chewing. They move the mandible at the temporomandibular joint. There are four pairs of muscles of mastication. Temporalis, side of your head. Masseter on your cheek. Lateral and medial trigoids are more on the inside of your mouth. And you can't see the trigoids here, but the two big major muscles of chewing are the temporalis and masseter. The bucinator is in your cheeks that helps push the food back in between your teeth if they get pushed out of, uh, out of the mouth cavity proper. <clears throat> There's the lateral trigoids and the medial trigoids, which you see attached from uh, the uh, maxilla to the jaw, to the, uh, to the jawbone, which is our mandible. Uh, but they're smaller and more involved in moving the jaw like this, side to side and forward and backward, less uh, for chewing. Muscles that move the the tongue, by the way, glossus is refers to tongue. So whenever you see that suffix, glossus, we're talking about tongue muscles. So genioglossus muscles originate on the mandible, protect the, uh, pro protract the tongue. What do we mean by protect the tongue? Well, stick your tongue out somewhere. Mm, 
that's protracting your tone. The left and right styloglossus muscles originate out of the styloid process of the temporal bone. When you look at a skull, you can see that. It's a very long, pointy structure on the bottom side of your skull. Left and right hyoglossus muscles originate the hyoid bone. I'm going to let you look through these. I don't need to explain. Okay, this shows you some of the muscles associated with your tongue in that region. More muscles that move the tongue. I don't need to, there I, I told you glossus means tongue. Don't need to explain these. They're very straightforward. So I'm just going to let you take a look at these and fill in your notes. Okay, more muscles associated with the uh, innermost part of the mouth. Uh, take a look at these. They each have their own function, but I don't go into all the details of all these muscles in this lecture. Muscle of the pharynx, which is the area around the throat. It's a funnel-shaped tube that lies posterior to both the oral and nasal cavities. Muscles form, help form or attach this tube, aid in swallowing. Primary pharynx muscles are the pharyngeal constrictors, superior, middle, and inferior. They initiate swallowing, so they really help you swallow your food. Help elevate or tense the palate when swallowing. So what we mean is as the muscles pull, lift the soft palate up so that food and beverage don't get into your nasal cavity. Muscles of the anterior neck, so the muscles on the front side of your neck. Suprahyoid muscles above the hyoid bone. Infrahyoid bones would be below the hyoid bone. So you can see the muscles here. I don't go into great detail in the lecture about these, but they all help move the um, hyoid bone and or your head and or the structures associated with the anterior part of the neck. And they're showing you cadaver muscles, same way. Anterior and lateral neck muscles, they flex the head and neck downward. Neck flexion and head flexion refer to the same movement. That's basically putting your chin down to your chest. Main muscles are the sternocleidomastoid and the three scalenes. Sternocleidomastoid is one of my favorite muscles because the three places that attaches give it its name. Sternum, right here, center of your chest. Clido, clavicle, which is your cl collarbone. And mastoid, which is a bump on the bottom of your skull. So it's here and here and angling up. So if you feel the muscles kind of angles down, and if someone was really in good shape, not me, you would see it very clearly coming down from the bottom of their skull down to their anterior chest. So you can see it here, sternocleidomastoid. It's uh, not in the normal position because the person is looking to their right, but you can see some of these other muscles associated with movement of the head and neck. Posterior neck muscles, they extend the head and neck. So that's looking upward. Their trapezius attaches the skull and helps extend the head and neck. That's that large muscle. That's the connector between your shoulder and your neck. It goes quite a ways downward, but it really helps you shrug and helps you move your shoulders. Primary function is to help move the pectoral girdle. Uh, I don't know why that was there, but anyway, this shows you some of the muscles of the posterior neck. Splenus capitis, sternocleidomastoid is here. Uh, some of these are cut so you can see the deeper muscles. And there's those same muscles in the cadaver. Okay, moving onward, muscles of the vertebral column. They're complex, have multiple origins and insertions. Again, this is all information that you can just read, does not need to be explained. <laughs> Here's some of the muscles associated with the vertebral column. And these are the same muscles in a cadaver. These are the muscles that uh, connect between vertebrae, intervertebral muscles. Muscles of respiration involves inhalation, breathing in, exhalation, breathing out. During inhalation, several muscles contract to increase the dimension of the thoracic cavities. So inhalation is the active process. Uh, normally, exhalation is a passive process. During exhalation, some respiratory muscles contract, others relax. Normally, most of them relax. <laughs> collectively decreasing the dimension of the thoracic cavity and pushing the air out. You find them on the anterior and posterior source of surfaces of the thorax and are covered by more superficial muscles that move the upper limb. So those muscles associated with your shoulder cover many of these muscles of respiration. So you can see some of these muscles here. These are intercostals that raise and lower the uh, ribs. And the diaphragm is what contracts to increase the volume of the chest cavity. When this contracts, air moves in because the pressure is lower. It's a little counterintuitive. When pressure is low, air rushes in. When pressure is high, air rushes out. The scalenes also help lift the ribs. And this shows you those same muscles in a cadaver. 
So external intercostals and internal intercostals, you can see they move in different, uh, they are, the fibers move in different directions and they have different functions. This shows you the diaphragm. You can see the esophageal opening. This is the opening where the esophagus goes through and the caval opening is where blood vessels go through. Diaphragm is an internally placed dome-shaped muscle and it forms a partition between thoracic and abdominal cavities. It's the most important muscle associated with breathing. So when you breathe in, it goes from being relaxed and, and curved to flattened and contracted. <laughs> that increases thoracic cavity size, decreasing the pressure, <laughs> and air rushes in. When the diaphragm contracts, central tendon is pulled inferiorly towards the abdominal cavity, thereby increasing vertical dimensions. So when a space is larger, it's got lower pressure, and when it's compressed, it's got higher pressure. Muscle of the abdominal wall, four pairs of muscles, you can see them here. Not a lot to explain. You can see the deeper muscles here on our right and the more superficial muscles on our left. They're showing you the same muscles of the cadaver. Okay, we can see external oblique, muscles move, the muscle fibers go this way. Internal oblique, muscle fibers go the opposite direction and transverse abdominus go across, transverse meaning across the long axis of the body. Each of these helps you move your torso in different ways. Muscle of the pelvic floor, I'll let you take a look at this. Do not need explanation. So fill in your notes, you should be good to go. Okay, that's the end of that chapter. As I told you, there's not gonna be a huge amount on chapter 11 on the test. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right to chapter 13, superficial anatomy. This is one of my favorites. Now, the reason why I like it so much is because most of you are becoming nurses or other similar healthcare providers. Now, there's a lot of anatomy that's internal, but the part of the patients that you'll be working with primarily, unless you're assisting surgeons, will be the outside of their body. Now, if I was putting together uh, textbooks, I would make surface anatomy be the number one first chapter. But it's put here about in the middle. Uh, I'm not sure why. It's just tradition. Uh, surface anatomy is super important because that's the part of most patients that you'll be interacting with. So I emphasize this chapter pretty heavily. Okay, surface anatomy. It's a branch of gross anatomy. Remember, gross anatomy, unaided, naked eye examine shapes and markings on the surface of the body as they relate, relate deeper structures. Now, many of the surface anatomy features are named based on the bones or muscles just below them. Essential locating and identifying anatomic structures prior to studying internal gross anatomy. Healthcare personnel use surface anatomy to help diagnose medical conditions and to treat patients. And this is also important for doctors because they're not generally cutting into a patient to diagnose them. They're diagnosing them based on what they can sense from the surface, sounds and colors and movement and uh, things like that. More surface anatomy, there's four techniques generally in examining surface anatomy. First is visual inspection, just looking, observing the structure and the markings of surface features. Second, palpation, feeling. Now, I'm always really put out, believe it or not, when I go to the doctors and they never lay their hand on me. You know, they're just like, yeah, hey, get away from me, you're icky. Um, I like it when doctors kind of, I mean, I'm not looking to get felt up, but when they feel body parts, it gives a lot more information to the healthcare provider than if they just peek at you or listen to your um, symptoms. Palpation is really important for finding swelling, uh, for finding spots where there could be pain, et cetera. <coughs> and percussion, this is a less commonly used thing anymore where they tap on the body. Now, some doctors will put a stethoscope on your back and tap, uh, listening for sounds made when they make percussion or sounds. And that has often to do with what's happening with your lungs or other internal thoracic structure. Osculation, often associated with percussion. Listening to the sounds emitted from organs. So percussion usually goes with osculation, but often doctor just listens or healthcare provider listens to the sounds that are happening inside your body 
can give a pretty good sense as to what's happening. Okay, so here are some superficial structures that you should know. Auricular having to do with ear, orbital meaning around the eye, nasal. You guys get the idea. You should know these surface features. This is the anterior view of some of the same structures, buccal meaning mouth. Um, filtrum is this little groove on your nose. You guys can take a look. Mental meaning chin. Cranium. The cranial region is covered by the scalp, composed of skin and subcutaneous tissue. Cranium can be subdivided into three regions, each having prominent surface anatomy features. Frontal region, forehead. Covering the frontal region is the frontalis muscle, which overlies the frontal bone. Now, this muscle, the name of it has been changed, so just keep your eye open. Sometimes it's called the frontalis. Sometimes it's called the frontal belly of the frontalo-occipitalis, and sometimes it's called the frontal belly of the epicranius, which I think is where it is now in those iterations. The frontal region terminates at the superciliary arches, which is your eyebrow region. Auricular region having to do with your ear. Interesting, this is the only flat part of your skull. The side is the only part that's flat. That's why sometimes it's called the squamous region. Squamous meaning flat, so it's only the side of your head that's flat. Composed of the visible structures associated with the ear, and the ear's internal organs, which are important in hearing and equilibrium or balance. The oracle or pinna, which is the ear that sticks out, is a fleshy part of the external ear. Within the oracle is a tubular opening into the middle ear called your external auditory canal, which is your ear hole. The mastoid process is posterior and inferior to the oracle. That's that big lump that attached to that muscle I was telling you about earlier today. The face or uh, well, in the face, we're talking about the orbital ocular region, which is we're talking about the eyes. Uh, it includes the eyeballs, the associated structures, anything right around your eye. Surface features protect the eye, the eyelids, eyebrows, the cheek. or um, The cheekbone, which is part of your um, max. Eyebrows protect against sunlight and potential mechanical damage. That means hitting something hits you in front of the eye. Eyelids close reflexively to protect against objects moving near the eye. As a matter of fact, if you want to put something in your eye, you can't just inhibit that reflex normally. You have to actually physically hold your eye open if you want to put something like a contact in. In my case, putting eye drops in lately. Uh, eyelashes prevent airborne particles from contacting the eyeball. Also, make your eyes look better. But they catch uh, bits of dust that are coming. The superior palp superior palpebral fissure, upper eyelid crease. Now, this is a very broad generalization. I did not write this bullet, but it is one of the main ways that de that uh, visually determine whether someone is, is of Asian or Caucasian or non-Asian descent would be the superior palpebral fissure, not as obvious in people with Asian heritage. That's the better way to put it. The nasal region of the face contains the nose. The bridge is this part right here under where my glasses are formed by the union of the nasal bones. The nasal bones are right here under the hard part of my nose. Fleshy part of the nose is called dorsum nasi. This is all the part that moves. Tip of the nose is called the apex. If you remember, I did I talk to you guys yet about the heart? I think I pre-recorded that. You guys are going to get that later. Apex is the tip. It's pointing down. The opposite. Normally, we consider the apex as the top of something. In this case, the apex is the tip, which is pointing downward. The nostrils are external nares. Now we're talking about the holes here. It turns out holes, there's a, there's an interesting riddle. What is a hole made out of? And the answer is nothing. That's the whole point of what a hole is. Now we're not talking about the side of the hole. We're not talking about this fleshy part of your nose here. That is your uh, ollie. The nostrils are the holes, which is the absence of tissue filled with air. The olinase, which is the wing of the nose, forms the flared lateral margin of each nostril. So we're talking about these things on the side here. Was the alanese, not the nostrils. Hmm. Oral region, your mouth, inferior to the nasal, includes the buccal and cheeks. So this is everything on the side. Fleshy upper and lower lips, labia, uh, structures of the oral cavity in your mouth, which can be observed when the mouth is open. So anything that you can see when you open someone's mouth. The vertical depression between the nose and upper lip is called the philtrum. I pointed that earlier. That's that little indentation formed when the uh, two sides of your upper lip fused together in the um, embryological period. Mental region, if you guys remember, I told you mental is your chin. Mentum tends to be pointed in almost triangular in females and squared off in males. That's also a gross oversimplification or generalization. 
Not always the case. Women tend to have slightly more pointed chins, men heavier, more rounded chins, but not always. That's not really even the best way to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. It's the pelvis, if you remember. Triangles of the neck, these are the structure here on the anterior post and lateral sides of the neck. <clears throat> um, these don't need explaining, but you should fill them in just in case there's something that comes up from the tech on, on the test about this text. The neck can be divided into anterior, posterior, and lateral, so front, back, and side. So these show you the different uh, triangles, and each of them has different structures running through them. As you can imagine, the carotid contains the carotid artery. Okay, anterior region neck in the front. Larynx, it's your Adam's apple. Let's just bump the sticks out here. It's the uppermost port, part of your larynx. Inferior to the larynx are the cricoid, cartilage, and trachea. So that's the ligaments down, or the uh, cartilage is inferior to the larynx. It terminates at the sternal or jugular notch. That's that little indentation. If you run your finger down your neck and you feel this like little U-shaped indentation at the top of your chest cavity or your thorax, rib cage, sternum. Uh, there's a little indentation that's called the sternal or jugular notch. Neutral region, the posterior part of your neck, has a spinal cord, cervical vertebrae, and associated structures. Bump at the lower boundary of this region is ver vertebral prominence. So if you run your hand down your neck, the first really big bump that you feel at the base of your neck is the called the vertebral prominence. Superiorly along the midline of the neck is the ligamentum nuchae, a thick ligament uh, that runs from C7 in your uh, neck to the nuchal lines of the skull. And those are lines associated with the base of the skull. Left and right lateral portions, again, sternocleidomastoid. These are just kind of factual stuff that don't need to be explained. Just get your notes filled in. Not a whole lot of conceptual stuff, mostly just factual. <clears throat> Thorax, talking about the area below your neck and above your uh, above your abdominal cavity. Superior portion of the trunk sandwiched between the neck superiorly and the ab abdomen inferiorly, and that includes your upper back as well, by the way. Consists of the check and chest and upper back. On the anterior surface of the chest are two dominating surface features of the thorax. Clavicles, which run along from shoulder to sternum, and the sternum, which is right here in the center. Clavicles, paired clavicles of the and the sternal jugular notch represent the border the, between the thorax and neck. So you can run your hand along the clavicle and across that little jugular notch and across that way. That's where the thorax ends and the neck begins. On the superior anterior surface, where they extend between the base of the neck and right and left sides laterally to the shoulders are your clavicles. Left and right costal margins of the rib cage form the inferior boundary of the thorax, we're talking about the bottom of your rib cage. The costal angle or costal arch is where the costal margins join to form an inverted V at the xiphoid process. We put our fingers on the xiphoid process when we want to do uh, chest compressions. It's a marker so that we don't put our hand on the xiphoid process. If you pushed on that, it could puncture a lung, cause some damage when you're doing CPR. <laughs> on a thin person, many of the ribs can be seen. Not on me because I'm a big guy. Big meaning overweight. Okay. Uh, most of the ribs, with the exception of the first one, can be palpated. Why can't you feel the first one? Because it's underneath your clavicle, so you can't feel it. The sternum, right here, the bone in the center of the chest, palpated readily as the midline bony structure in the thorax or chest. The manubrium, the body, and xiphoid process may also be pal palpated. So the manubrium is this little kind of uh, high knot shaped part at the top. The body runs down the most of the rest of your thorax. And then the xiphor process is that little bump. If you go all the way down to the bottom of your sternum, there's a little pointy part at the bottom that is your xiphor process. It's an attachment point for muscles. Sternal angle can be felt as an elevation between the manubrium and the body. So if you actually run your hand down along uh, the sternum, there's a little ridge right in between those two bones. If you press in real hard, you can feel that. It's called the sternal angle. Sternal angle is clinically important because it's the level of the costal cartilage of the second rib and used as a landmark for counting ribs. <laughs> Excuse me, folks, I'm still getting over that cold. Abdomen or your belly. <laughs> On the anterior surface of the abdomen, the umbilicus or navel is a prominent depression or projection 
into the middle end of the abdominal wall. So if you have an Audi, or any of your depression or projection. By the way, that's completely uh, genetically determined. It doesn't have anything to do with how your umbilicus was tied off. In the midline of the abdominal anterior surface is the linea alba, a tendon structure that extends inferiorly from the xiphoid process, that bump I told you about, <laughs> to the pubic symphysis, which is right in between two pubic bones at the top of your pelvis. Left and right rectus abdominis muscles and their tendon insertions are called six pack abs, especially if you have urine shape and don't have a lot of fat covering those muscles. The superior aspect of the ilium or iliac crest terminates anteriorly at the anterior superior iliac spine. So put your hands on your hips, you feel those bony structures there. That's the ilia or iliac crest. Attached to the anterior superior iliac spine is the inguinal ligament, et cetera, et cetera. My voice is starting to go. So if I don't need to explain it, I won't. These are some key superficial anterior thoracic structures that you should <laughs> These are posterior thoracic structures that you should know. These are some areas under the armpit or axilla that you should know. Okay, shoulder and upper limb region are clinically important because of frequent trauma to these body regions. We often land on our shoulder when we fall down sideways. Vessels of the upper limb are often used as pressure sites, so taking blood pressure or sites for drawing blood, providing nutrients in terms of IV and administering medicine, again, IV or injection. The shoulder, the scap scapula, clavicle, and proximal part of the humerus collectively form the shoulder and is covered with your deltoid muscle. <coughs> the acromion is the bump in the anterior shoulder. So when you feel your shoulder right here and you feel a bump sticking up, that's the acromion of the scapula. The rounded curve of the shoulder is formed by the thick deltoid muscle, frequent site for intramuscular injections, Another common spot is the gluteal region, because they're both common areas due to the thick muscle associated there. Axilla or armpit, clinically important because nerves, blood vessels, and lymph nodes are there. So you can feel or palpate lymph nodes to see if they're swollen other than under your chin and other places. The pectoralis major forms the fleshy anterior axillary fold. This is dorsi. I'm going to let you read this. My voice is starting to go. Your arm. The upper part of the arm is called the brachium. Uh, really, the arm, the entire arm is called the brachium, but brachial usually refers to upper arm from the elbow up to the shoulder. On the anterior side of the arm, cephalic vein is evident um, for muscular um, in shape individuals. Okay, more information you should know, but I don't need to explain. The basilic vein is sometimes evident along the medial side of the upper limb, so basically on the inside of your arm here. Brachial artery becomes subcutaneous along the medial side of the brachium. Its pulse may be detected here. Clinically important in measuring blood pressure. So this is often how blood pressure is taken. So these show you some of the key structures here. I do have a meeting starting soon. So I'm going to finish up with this pretty quickly. Arm and the elbow. These are, this is information you should know, but doesn't need to be explained. <coughs> Sorry, folks, it's just running out of um, verbal power here. Some more superficial structures that you should know. Forearm, radius, ulna, muscles, control hand movements. Please fill this in. More about the forearm. These are some superficial muscles associated with the forearm that you, you should know. Hand, uh, gluteal region, talking about your butt. The gluteal cleft uh, separates the two halves of your butt. <clears throat> the few prominences, the inferior portion of each buttock is the ischial tuberosity, it can be palpated. More stuff that you should know. Uh, by the way, uh, the most powerful muscle you've got in your entire body is the gluteus maximum. Well, factoid, you should know, it's for running and walking, why it's so powerful. Thigh, 
muscular bony features identified here. Uh, again, this is all factual stuff that you should know. I don't need to explain a whole lot of it. Sorry to go so fast, but hopefully you guys can pause and fill in your notes. Thigh and knee. Patella and kneecap. More superficial muscle, uh, features of the thigh and knee, anterior and posterior. <laughs> and then the lower leg, the uh, tibialis region, or tibial region, tibialis anterior is a muscle here on the front, and posterior calf region, and lateral view of that same region. And your foot, these are P medial uh, metacarpophalangeal joints, excuse me, metacarpophalangeal, um, interphalangeal joints. Proximal interphalangeal joints, distal interphalangeal joints, for you, those of you who are curious. More key structures. Foot and toes. <laughs> Phalanges, that is your toes and fingers. They have the same names. Uh, longitudinal arches are the ones that go from front to back. Distal into the medial longitudinal arch, the head of the metatarsal one, bump. All right, that is the end of that. So um, that's it. Nobody came, so there's no questions. Uh, if you have any questions while watching this, please let me know. Hope to see someone back next week. Um, if not, I'll just keep recording these. But send me emails if you have any questions, and good luck with this week's uh, material on Visible Body. Have a great rest of your week. Talk to you later, guys.